pray together. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, I ask you to speak to our hearts now. Draw us close and turn us into the men and women you've asked us to be. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning. Man, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you're a guest today, my name is Trey Kelly. I'm the lead pastor here. Thank you. And uh, if you're not a guest, you know we are in the middle of a series on politics, and you came back. I'm proud. And if you're a first-time guest, you're like, wait, what? How do I get out of here? Actually, I want to address that very quickly, especially one of the things I love about our church 
uh, and honestly, we designed it this way, is, is that every week we have people who attend our church who don't necessarily believe what we believe as a church. You're here, and you're not sure about faith. You're kind of checking out Jesus, or maybe you had an, a, a previous faith, and then you kind of fell away from the church, or you left the church, or you fled the church, or you ran away screaming from the church, whatever. But now you're, you're back in. You're kind of dipping your toes in the water, and, man, we're, we're honored that you're here. Um, and I want you to know, uh, I know the topic of politics. You're probably like, ah, oh, come on. But, but give me 33 minutes, okay? Because it's probably not going to go how you think it's going to go. Um, and I'll also, I said it last week, and I'll, I'll, say it, I'll say it this week as well, especially if you don't consider yourself a Christ follower today. I want you to know that, that what we talked about last week, what we're going to talk about this week, what we're going to talk about next week, um, same God yesterday, today, and forever. It's what he's always asked us to do. Um, I, I just, I'll go first. We, Christians, we aren't perfect, and sometimes we mess up. And, and I'm going to own that right now and say, hey, look, I'm convinced that if, if more men and women of Jesus listened to him and, and, and got right what we're talking about in this series, um, I think there's a really good chance you'd be a Christian already because uh, he, he's really amazing. And so uh, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for listening. And especially if you're not a Christian today, just have fun because you don't have to do any of this. You don't have to listen. You just get to watch me and all the Christians squirm <laughs> as we try to figure out how to make this work. So uh, anyway, all right. So we started this series last week, series on, on politics. If, if you missed it, if you weren't here, if you want to go back and catch up, uh, the best way to do that is on our app. We put all our content there. You can go back. You can see where we've been. Our series always build on each other. And so I'm kind of going to give a quick recap, and then we're going to dive in <clears throat> to what we're talking about today. The reason we're doing this entire series is because of just a truth that you've experienced and I've experienced, and we've all experienced, talked about it last week, and it's this. It's that nothing divides like politics. Um, college football is close. <laughs> but nothing divides like, like politics, quicker into us and them, good versus bad, even in church. We talked about this last week. Um, it, it can become easy if you're a uh, Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled Christ follower that, to think that the way you think about politics is just the way everyone who is a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled Christ follower, the way they think about politics. Well, I've been doing this long enough. That's not true. Um, there, there are people in our church who are convinced that the fate of the world hangs in the balance and that this candidate has to win on Tuesday. Um, and I'm not even going to say their names today. I'm going to try real hard to just not do that. Um, other people in this room are like, how could you possibly think that? Everyone knows that a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled Christ follower has to vote for, you thought I was going to say it, but I didn't, uh, someone else. And we talked about this, we talked about this uh, last week. Um, it's a big country. We all have different backgrounds. And the Holy Spirit can lead us uh, to different conclusions. And so while we believe and we think in this divided nation, in this divided time, that the most important question we should ask is this one, how should I vote? I believe God is asking us to answer a much bigger question question. Not at the expense of this one. I said it last week. You, you should vote. You should pray. You should invite the Holy Spirit in. You should make a decision based on truth because Jesus said the truth is going to set you free. So know the truth. Pray. Holy Spirit can fill convictions. Go in there. Vote. And then relax. <laughs> Trust God with the results. We talked about this last week. He was in charge in 2016. Some of you are like, amen. Some of you are like, no, he wasn't. But the good news is he then flipped in 2020. And so now you're like, finally, God's back in charge. And the other people are like, where'd he go? I said it last week. Our Heavenly Father and his son Jesus are not in heaven looking at each other saying, I hope the Americans get this right. They're not. They're in charge. So this can't be the most important question we ask because we are one out of 162 million votes. You know, I think God would put on you the weight of the country but not give you more authority in it? See, we get fed that, but, it, but it's not true. we got to vote. we got to trust God. But the reason we're doing this series is because I believe particularly in this moment, when it is true, but we are about as divided as we've been in a really long time, 
I believe God's people have the chance to shine. We have the chance to display the goodness and the glory of our Heavenly Father. But it will not come from the answer to that question. It will not because there are too many answers. So the question we're wrestling with in this series that I'm inviting you to wrestle with, especially right now in this season, it's far more difficult to answer than how should I vote. And it has much more far-reaching eternal implications. But the good news is you have 100% authority and 100% responsibility to get this one right in your lives. And it's this. This season, who should I love? And last week, we talked about the answer. And guess what it is? Everyone. So you know what that means? That means we've got to love the other team. That means we've got to love the other team's candidate. That means we have to support them. It doesn't mean we have to vote for them. But it means we have to love them. It means we have to want the best for them. It means we have to hope good things for their lives. And so the question we're really wrestling with for the next few weeks, well, last week, this week, and next week, the Sunday leading up to the election, and then the Sunday right after the election, we just decided to dive right in. I could have done this earlier. I didn't. I waited. Here's the challenge. As Christ followers, can we learn to disagree politically while loving unconditionally? Can we If you were here last week, Jesus was pretty clear. We can and we must. Because he said the mission depends on it. Not how we vote, but our unity. And how unified we are despite our diversity. We can disagree wildly but love unconditionally because that will get the world's attention. So that's the challenge from last week. Next two weeks, today and next Sunday, we're going to talk about how to do that. And I'll go ahead and tell you, it's actually a pretty simple concept. I say it all the time. God's not that complicated. We complicate him, but he's pretty clear. It'll take two weeks to learn and a lifetime to master which is pretty much what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat the key, the solution, the answer to learning how to disagree politically and love unconditionally. It comes down to a choice, a choice I'm invited to make and a choice all of us who consider ourselves Christ followers are invited to make, and it's this one. We can choose to evaluate our politics through the filter of our faith, rather than create a faith that supports our politics. And I know what you're thinking. But pastor, I do that. It's the other side that doesn't. (laughs) They're the ones, dot, dot, dot. And look, if that's your first reaction, I get that. I'm not knocking it. We've been taught that. But I want you to think, again, I want you to try as hard as you can for the next few minutes to to try to keep everything internal. Do your best to just ask questions about yourself and not the other people. Or, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this. You need to play that on this station. Or you need to play that. I don't even say stations because you know the stations. So just pick whichever one you want me to help. (laughs) Here's the question for us, especially if you consider yourself partisan. And that's not a negative word. It just means you have strong beliefs and you have a team and you're on that team. There's nothing wrong with being on that team. God's not mad at you for being on that team. That's your team for a reason and you can support that team and you can, you can love that team. There's nothing. It's okay. Here's the question. Because if faith is the filter, 
If Jesus is the guide, that means from time to time, there will be space created between our faith and our politics. So my question for for you is you're saying, hey, do I do this? When's the last time you allowed the Holy Spirit to create space between yourself and your politics? When's the last time you were able to say, you know what? My team is wrong on this one. My team is not handling this the way Jesus would handle this. My team's not handling this the way Jesus would ask us to do it. My, my team, my team's just wrong. Because if faith is the filter, there's going to be space because, because we, we, they're humans. They're not perfect. So there's going to be space. Not only between your politics, but even between your preferred candidate. When's the last time you allowed the Holy Spirit to create space between what your preferred candidate said, what your preferred candidate did, what you've, what you've read about them? When's the last time you were able to, in Jesus' name, say, you know what? My person, see, I said person. I didn't say guy. I didn't say gal. I said my person. Because I know you're all just waiting. You're like, he's actually got an agenda, and he's trying to convince us to vote one way. And if we listen hard enough, so let me be very clear. I'm not smart enough to do that. Okay, I'm not smart enough to try to infiltrate. This is, that is not the goal. So if you're waiting, it's not happening. But when's the last time you allowed your faith to create space between you and your political team? And your answer is probably somewhere along the lines of this. See if this sounds familiar, if this resonates with your soul. But pastor, we can't do that. Because then we might lose. See, you don't get it, Pastor. See, they're evil. Like they're they're all they hate America. And they want to destroy the country. You don't you don't get it. They're not human. They're something else. And they're dangerous. And so I I, I can't create space. Like I, I can't do that. Because then my team might lose. And then, and then God might lose. So I can't, I can't do, I can't do it. I can't do what you're asking me to do. Because they're too blank, whatever, however you want to finish that sentence. Now look, if, if, you, if you feel that way, if you've ever felt that way, I, I understand. You, you were taught to feel that way. But I want to say very clearly, there is nothing about our faith that supports that position. In fact, the core truth behind that opinion is dangerous and detrimental, not only to us, but to the entire world. Let me explain why. We've been saying for the last few weeks that nothing divides like politics. Well, the reason that's the case, and I'm not, I'm not knocking it, it's just fact, is because politicians learned a long time ago the best way to stay in power is to divide. And again, I'm not knocking it. Like, this isn't, this isn't a judgment. Power in our country is finite. It is a zero-sum game. You either vote for them or you vote for someone else. And, and, and politicians, they understand human brains and they understand how we, how we think and, and political parties and, and news organizations, they, they get it. And the simplest way to keep us divided, the simplest way to keep you on my team and to never have you look at the other team as a possible alternative is to make them awful. They can't be human. They can't be people we disagree with that just, they have good ideas and we have good ideas you pick. We, we, they that doesn't work because then you might choose the other team. And so there's a really heavy investment in politicians because I'm not sure if you understand. They only get to do things if they have power. And so to keep power, they divide us. And one of the strongest tools they use, the tool that we're going to talk about for the rest of our time, the tool I believe is Christ followers. We have to be so aware of because it's so easy to fall susceptible to it. 
And it is so dangerous when we do. But the tool that turns people into the other is a tool we were all taught as little kids. A tool that was incredibly beneficial when we were little kids. But has dangerous implications if we aren't aware of it in adulthood. The tool? Disgust. I know, you're like, who wants to talk about that? Disgust is a feeling of revulsion aroused by something unpleasant or offensive. Did you know you were not born knowing how to be disgusted? That is not a natural human instinct. We have to be taught disgust. And if you don't believe me, hang out with a toddler and watch what they put in their mouths. We teach them, oh, no, no. If we're disgusted enough, they're like, oh, that must be disgusting. So we're taught at a very early age. And look, disgust, it's helpful. It helps protect us from things that could harm us. You know, it is a very helpful thing. If you were, uh, you know, hanging out with your friend and they offered you some bubble gum, well, you're a human. Who doesn't want bubble gum? You're like, yeah, man, give me some bubble gum. But if they reached into their mouth and handed you, yeah, you would be like, oh, I mean, you would swat it to the ground. And if you wouldn't, now you know. We don't do that. So we get it. It protects us from germs. It protects us from things that could harm us. But here's the danger with the disgust. It becomes dangerous when we project it onto people. And I know what you're sitting there thinking. Well, I'm not disgusted with people. You sure about that? Again, I'm just, uh, just let's, let's make space here. No judging. We're not looking at other people. But I want you to think about how you feel when you see the political ad for the other team and that candidate starts talking. You don't feel delighted. <laughs> Ugh. Who in their right minds would ever support that person? <laughs> or think about the way you get cut off in traffic, but then you notice the bumper sticker, and they're on your team. <laughs> You're like, it's fine, man. You can cut me off. We're on the same team. You pull up beside them. We're going to change the world Tuesday. Yeah. And they're driving like, what is this lunatic doing? Now, same situation, get cut off, but what if they have a bumper sticker for the other team? I bet you're not as kind. Well, of course they would cut me off. Monsters. Most despicable group of people. I don't even know how they breathe. I don't even know how they live. We're fed this. What do you think negative ads are? I'll tell you what, they're not. Truthful. This week, I've seen ads saying both candidates were on both sides of several positions. I'm like, well, that can't be true. But truth wasn't the point. The point was galvanize, to divide, to keep us disgusted. Because when humans attach disgust to other humans, it doesn't stop there. Disgust turns into disdain. We develop contempt for them. We are indignant towards them. And eventually, it leads to dismissal. We dismiss their humanity. They stop becoming humans. They stop becoming people. They stop becoming souls. They stop becoming dads and moms and husbands and fathers, and they become evil. They become less than. 
they become dangerous. They become people we have to stop. And then, just as we're like, we're doing all of this in Jesus' name. We find ourselves in seasons like this doing two things. One, we deny the undeniable. Let's be honest. Look at me. Don't look around. Look at me. Don't look around. Look at me. You all had a thought at some point in this campaign. You heard a speech. You heard a point. You heard something. And your initial thought was, that, that actually sounds like a pretty good idea. And then you found out it was the other team's idea. Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. I didn't mean to agree. I didn't mean. Because we have to do that. We have to deny the undeniable. Now, that's just public policy. The real kicker for Christ followers, the real quick kicker for those of us who are doing our best to exemplify the heart of our king on earth, we don't just deny the undeniable. We defend the indefensible. Because my team's doing it. Yeah, I know that adds a lie. I know they made that up. Don't care. Let's go help my team win. I know they didn't really say that. Or I know they said those words, but it's clipped. And if you watch the whole clip, what they actually said was this, and is they didn't mean any of that. But who cares? The ends justify the means. We got to win, Trey. We got to win. So if I have to deny the undeniable, if I have to defend the indefensible, I'll do it. And listen, that is a perfectly fine approach for a political partisan. But we can't do it in the name of our King of Kings. He never did. He never would. And I've done a whole ser- sermon on this. So I'll be really quick. The whole ends justify the means thing. Can I talk about that for one second? You know our end was secured over 2,000 years ago on the other side of the planet. You get that, right? When Jesus walked out of the grave, it wasn't a magic trick. It was the final blow. Sin was defeated. Hell lost. All we're doing now is trying to run up the score. And here's what I believe Jesus has been teaching us the whole time. Listen to me, Christ followers. When the ends are secured, which they are, the means are all that matter. That's it. We don't have to stoop. We can stand on the foundation that is our king. And how do we do that? This way. We choose to evaluate our politics through the filter of our faith rather than creative faith that supports our politics. Because if your faith allows for disgust, if your faith allows for demonizing humans, if your faith allows for you to determine in your own capacity that another person is unworthy of love, I got bad news. According to Jesus, when we do that, we are guilty. Both of misbelieving and misbehaving. Because when Jesus was on earth, he taught us a better way. And I want to take you to his story because who cares what I think, right? I've just been trying to build tension. I've been trying to get us all leaning in. That's all I do. So our hero, Jesus, can come in and solve the problem. Because he does. He did. Over 2,000 years ago. And I'll just say this. When we adopt Jesus' way, it's not just better for the world. It is. It's also better for us. So I want to take you to a story from Life of Jesus, written 
by a man named Matthew. Matthew wrote the first of the four biographies we have of Jesus' life. And I'll go ahead and tell you, Matthew is one of the stars of this story. And so here's what we see. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew. That's the guy writing the the biography. He's talking about himself in the third person. He's giving us his origin story. How did Matthew become a disciple? He's telling us. He was sitting at his tax collector's booth. That doesn't mean much to us today. You may not dig the IRS, whatever. 2,000 years ago, tax collectors were a target of disgust. Because the tax collectors in the Roman Empire were known liars, con men, and thieves. See, the Roman government didn't really care a whole lot about the places they governed as long as you stayed peaceful and paid your taxes. And so they would hire locals to become tax collectors. And to incentivize the tax collectors, they didn't really check on how much they collected. And so Rome could decide your family owed $5. Well, guess what? The tax collector was fully empowered by the government to charge you $15. And if you didn't pay it, he could throw you in jail. You had to pay it. And then he would turn around and give Rome their $5. He would keep $10, smile at you, and walk away. Everyone knew they did it. And everyone hated their guts. Can you imagine how you would feel if you knew there was this person just out completely and totally taking advantage of people, you'd be mortified. That's what Matthew's saying. That was me. I was a tax collector. I wasn't a repentant tax collector. I was at my tax collector's booth. I was doing it. (laughs) And then Jesus shows up. And he says, follow me and be my disciple. So Matthew got up and followed him. He didn't say, Matthew, we got to talk about how you're doing these things. No, he just said, hey, come. He invited him into relationship. Spoiler alert, Matthew's life was changed, obviously. He wrote the biography. But he tells us an amazing story. After he's called, we don't know how long, it just says later. Could have been that night, could have been a few weeks, I don't know. But Matthew approaches Jesus with 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 a request. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and the other disciples to his home as dinner guests. Tax collectors had really nice homes. They had dinner. He says, hey, come, and I want you to meet my friends, many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. This is Matthew telling us 2,000 years later they were rough. Those are rough folks. And Jesus says, yes. No conditions. Of course I will come with you to meet your friends. So Jesus goes. And he has a meal with them. And he begins getting to know them. He begins getting to know their stories. And there's another group of people, the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. They did not like Jesus. They thought Jesus was causing trouble. Jesus was saying things like, you've heard it said, but I say. Who could do that? God, that's who. But they didn't believe he was God. And so they were constantly trying to trick him and trap him into something. It never worked because he was God. But they find out about this meal. They make their way to the house uninvited. And they don't engage. They pull one of his disciples aside. We don't know which one. Matthew probably saw it happen. They probably didn't ask Matthew because Matthew was engaged with his friends. It's possible some of the other disciples were standing back because they didn't know what to do either. They might have been a little uncomfortable. And so the Pharisees thought, this is my chance. And so they sidle up to one of Jesus' disciples. And they think this is going to work. They think this is going to score points. And they ask this question. They say, why? Why? Why does your teacher eat with such scum? Huh. They're talking about human beings. They're talking about people. But they're people they're disgusted with because of their behaviors, because of their practices, because they don't follow the rules like the Pharisees follow the rules. And so they're disgusted. 
So they have disdain, and they dismiss them. Now, before we judge the Pharisees too harshly, <laughs> let's think to how we feel again when we see the other team's ad, when we accidentally change it to the wrong news channel, <laughs> and we're like, ah, oh, it's like we're going to get infected. Oh, I don't want that on my television. Think about how you feel about the targets of your team's attacks. Because we all have them. Each team has people on the other side that they deem worthy of attack. And we jump in and dehumanize in the name of Jesus. It's not new. It's what the Pharisees did. 2,000 years ago, other side of the planet. Jesus responds two ways. First is a, uh, I'm going to call it, um, acute response. I think Jesus had a little glint in his eye when he said this. He turns to them because he hears what they're saying. He turns around and he says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And y'all are like, did he just call those people sick? No. No. He was putting the Pharisees' argument back on themselves. He would say, look, if you think you've got all the answers and you've perfectly figured out how to follow me and you see people who are getting it wrong, why on earth is your response to be disgusted? Why is your response to dismiss? Why is your response to, to demean? If you have the answers and they need the answers, why aren't you doing everything imaginable to connect with them so that you could actually have a conversation with them so that they would learn something? And Jesus knows the answer. He knows. He says, it's because you don't really care about them because you're disgusted with them. They've become the other to you. And so then Jesus says this. It's probably taken me 20 years to understand the full implications of what he means. But he looks at him and he says, hey, guys, I want you to go and learn the meaning of this scripture. And he quotes an Old Testament prophet, Hosea. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they're sinners. I want you to show mercy not offer sacrifices. The original context of that in this is the same. He's saying, I don't need you to enforce my rules. And I definitely don't need you to feel empowered to punish people that you feel like are breaking my rules. That's not your job. I don't need you to keep the law intact. I want you to show mercy. I want you to seek connection. I want you to seek understanding because that's what you were created to do. When you try to police, when you try to enforce rules, you step outside of your authority and you step into mine. And it never works well when you do that. And if you're a parent of more than one child, you have experienced this yourself, probably from your oldest child to one of your younger children. Somewhere in their journey, you caught wind or you watched your oldest child desperately trying to enforce your rules <laughs> in their name. You've all seen this. They start trying to punish the younger children for you. <laughs> and what did you do? Did you say, that's not a bad idea. I'm going to go take a bath. <laughs> no. You stepped in immediately and said, no, that's not your job. I'm the parent. I'll correct. I'll discipline. That's not for you to do. And it's hard because sometimes they're right. 
And they're like, that is exactly what I would have done, but you did it, so now I don't know what I'm going to do. <sighs> Guys, I'm convinced that's what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees and what he's saying to us. I don't need you to parent. I don't need you to enforce my rules, to enforce my consequences. I think there's a reason during Jesus' entire ministry, he positioned himself as one of us, and he invited us in to be brothers and sisters, and he called God the Father our Father. He was trying to teach us, Dad is in charge of the discipline. Dad will handle it. It's not our job to discipline. It's our job, according to Jesus, to show mercy, to seek connection. And that is where we'll pick up next week. Because that is the key to dismissing disgust from our hearts. It's connection. And I got great news and then we're done. You already know how to do this. This isn't even a new skill you have to learn. Because remember, here's what we're talking about. We want to live in a world where we can disagree politically and love unconditionally. And when we say it that way, you're like, impossible. But you already do it. You just did it in reverse. You began with love. Because we all have people in our lives we love unconditionally. And then one day we find out, oh, no, we disagree politically but you're already married. <laughs> or the day you find out you disagree with your parents. Or the day you find out you disagree with your children. Or the day you find out you disagree with your brother. You're like, I've always disagreed with my brother. <laughs> but you know how to do this. You know why? Love defeats disgust every single time. Parents, you've done some disgusting things to clean up after your children. But you did it because you loved them. Had they not been your children, you would not have done it. You would have said, this is someone else's job. Love defeats disgust. And every single one of us in this room already have someone in our lives that we loved first. And then we discovered we disagreed. And we figured out how to make it work. Next week, we're going to turn to Jesus again, and he's going to invite us to take that selective love and just apply it to the world he applies it to. And look, you're adults. You're free to do what you want. But I believe what we're being called to in this season is to be as Christ-like as possible, which means we must embrace this idea that we can decide to evaluate our politics through the filter of our faith rather than creative faith. That supports our politics. But it's up to you. Tuesday's coming. And then it'll be Wednesday. And then Thursday. And then Sunday again. And the question we're trying to get right is this one. Can we learn to disagree politically while loving unconditionally? And the answer is yes. We already do. You have people in your life you already do this with. Next week, we're going to learn how to apply it to everyone Jesus loves. But until then, I have one challenge and we're done. One challenge. Leading up to Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Thursday. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the disgust in your life. No judgment. No condemnation, just to reveal it. Hey, Holy Spirit, show me this week every time I feel disgusted, every time I want to dismiss, every time I want to demean, every time I want to toss away because they're an other. Will you show me that? Will you make me aware of that? Because here's what I know about you. If you're aware of it, you're not going to like it. Because you know Jesus has better. So this week, ask him to make you aware of the disgust. And then lay it at his feet. Say, Jesus, I don't want to feel this way about humans. I don't want to be at odds with you. 
I don't want to feel this way about someone you love, about someone who you believe has value, someone you died for, someone who has a soul that you care about. Jesus, rid disgust from our hearts so that we may love everyone you love. That's the prayer. And next week, we'll learn how to do it. Let me pray for you. God, we love you so much. We're just so grateful for your son. We're so grateful that you're in charge. We're so grateful that we don't have to worry that we can rest in your arms. And we know regardless of what happens Tuesday night, you're still king Wednesday morning, and that's enough. So Father, please help us to learn to stop parenting on your behalf. And instead, teach us how to be sons and daughters. Teach us how to reach out to understand our brothers and sisters so that we can love them like you do. We love you, Father. So your sons, let me pray. Amen. Amen. What an awesome day to be here, to hear such a timely message for us, Wellspring. I'm just so proud to be a part of a church that wants to be a light in our community, that wants to not make a point, but to tell people about a person, the person of Jesus. You know, what an awesome challenge for us this week, especially, you know, thank goodness we say we serve a God who is God today. He's gonna be God on Tuesday. He's gonna be God on Wednesday. He's gonna be God on Sunday. He is in control. So this week, when someone wants to maybe start complaining, tell them about something awesome your church did. Or when someone seems hopeless, maybe invite them to come to church with you to find Jesus. And we do this each and every week. We help create a place that people can find hope in a moment we're about to come to. When we give back to create a situation, one time someone can come and meet the God of the universe and find that hope or that joy that they've been looking for. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that really loves doing that. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the reminder that we are sons and daughters of the King. Dear Lord, help us to view each and every person we meet this week as our brothers and sisters. Dear Lord, burden our hearts to share you with them and to lay down our own thoughts and feelings and to say, God, whatever you would ask of me to reach my neighbor, my brother, my sister, I'll do it. Dear Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for their heart for this city. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Well, Wellspring, as the buckets are being passed, we got a couple things we need to talk about. But first, we are going to celebrate. I am so honored to get to share the results of our Love MB offering with you. Um, we know there's still a little bit left to come in this week, so we are confident that we are going to be bringing in over $90,000 for Love MB this year. Yes. Praise Jesus. Wellspring, I cannot tell you how proud I am to be a part of a church who puts quite literally our money where our mouth is and says, Myrtle Beach, we love you. The good we are going to be able to do in this community. But there's one other thing about this year that I wanna share with you. This has been the highest amount of gifts, individual gifts that we have ever received for Love and Be. So Wellspring, that means that more of our church than ever before gave toward this offering. And that has always been our heart. It is not about the dollar amount we bring in. It is about the participation of this church. So thank you for standing with us and proclaiming to this city that we love them. Yes. And we have so much to celebrate. We're gonna be celebrating again next week because next week we are going to have baptism live in the room on Sunday. And number one, if you have been feeling God tugging at your heart to take that step of faith, you can sign up for that today by going to this QR code on the screen or in the back of your seat or on our app. And we would love 
to have you come take that step with us. But if you're a part of this church, I would ask you, please do everything you can to be here next Sunday so that we can celebrate with those individuals that are taking that step of faith. And finally, this morning, if you are here and maybe you haven't gotten to connect or find community yet, we have a step for you to take too. Circle up for this semester starts tomorrow night, November 4th, and you can sign up for that here as well. And Circle Up is simply an opportunity for people that have not found their circle, their people yet, to explore that and to say, hey God, where would you have me to step in to find my people here? Wellspring, thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a church that wants to proclaim the love and hope of Jesus to our city. Let's stand one more time and praise God this morning. Oh,